Hi everyone, it's Mary, and I can't even tell you how excited I am. Guess what? We're in London right now, and we are interviewing. Okay, can you imagine? Get this, the princesses hairdressers. It's amazing that we've had this opportunity, and it's because of all of you at BehindTheChair.com that we were given an opportunity to come in and do something really, really special. So we're here today with Helen and Richard Ward from the Richard Ward Salon here in London, and um, we've actually just done a whole photo shoot, so you're seeing the cover, you're seeing the whole shoot, and it's a great opportunity for us to be able to sit down and have a chance for all of you to get to meet them. So, Helen, Richard, thank you so much. I can't even tell you what, what a huge, huge honor it is to be able to have a chance to spend some time with you today. You have to cut some of now. <laughs> so it's Lord and Lady now. <laughs> Do you know, um, it, it's, it's amazing to have you here. And um, I think the really interesting thing about, about royal weddings is there's so much of us, there's so much that we don't know about it. Um, and I think you have a really interesting opportunity in, with Kate Middleton because um, you know, she seems like such a real person and so forth. And now this is your first opportunity to do royalty, right? For a wedding? Yeah. Um, for this, yeah, this is, this is our first royal wedding, but yeah. I mean, hey. But you've you know, been doing royalty for quite a long <clears throat> time, right? Yeah, we've, we've, um, yes, I've, I've styled the hair of Queen Rania of Jordan, um, the Countess of Wessex, which is Prince Edward's wife, oh. has been my client, my personal client for about eight years been looking after her so I've been sort of tra I sometimes travel a little bit with her you know going over to the palace doing her hair she still comes very much comes into the salon yeah. um, I've got, we've got other members of our staff who are looking after a lot of the royal um, European royalty certainly Marie Chantal of Greece Princess Marie yeah. Chantal of Greece and the King of Greece so we're going to be very very busy on that day it sounds like it but you know I actually want to take you back because I, I think um, you know, um, hairdressers really wonder, how do you go from here as hairdressers, getting your license, you know, starting a salon, and all of a sudden end up doing really what I think, based on what we know, the biggest celebrities, aristocrats, royals. Where, where does that come from? We know that you started in a salon, and we know, Helen, you're the brains behind the business, right? Can I say that, Richard? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, I think the great thing is with us that we're very lucky that we both do such different things. So yeah. we're not treading on each other's toes in a work environment. You know, I'm looking after all the salon side, the artistic side, the sort of um, the celebrity side, the TV side, all of that kind of thing that, that goes along with, with the hair side. And Helen just makes sure, well, I was going to say she makes sure the bills are paid. But maybe <laughs> I make sure well, that all the, the maths are She cracks the whip. Clearly you do an amazing job in the education that you have in the salon. And that's not easy to do and to actually be able, you know, to take that sort of service. And I'd love to actually talk about that for a second is how do you create such a consistent service and make all of us feel like royalty when we're walking in the door? We sort of aim for trying to uh, give all of our clients 8 out of 10 experience 10 out of 10 times yeah. you know and I think that that really is the key for us we you know it's no good being 4 out of 10 one time 10 out of 10 the next you need to aim at that consistency so the client knows what to expect um, and being consistent is the hardest thing it is. you know it's I really tough to deliver I think of course it I would say it goes without saying that ultimately people are coming to get their hair cut so they want a decent haircut, they want a good haircut. But there are plenty and plenty of places, not just in London, but all over the world and all over the country that you can get good haircuts. So what we're trying to create is something a little bit more than that. Right. You know, I the would experience. say it's the experience, it's being looked after, it's making people feel that they're not just coming back for a good haircut, they're coming back because they really want to come back, because they love being there, because they're getting something a bit different, because they're seeing the same staff every time that they come in there. Every, you know, when they're phoning up booking an appointment, you know, they're not constantly told that someone's moved on, someone's left. You know, we all know that there's a Sassoon camp and there's a Leonard camp, right, yeah. in London. Yeah. You came from the Leonard camp. How would you describe the difference between the two? Well, Sassoon, you have the Sassoon, the Sassoon structure, which is probably sort of very sort of geometric, sort of a little bit, sort of very, very cutting, cutting, orientated. Um, all the focus, I would say, ultimately is on the, the haircuts. The Leonard side is, I would say, a little bit more of the glamorous side. It's a little bit more the society side, the celebrity side. It's dressing hair. I mean, equally, you know, I'd love to, you know, our ha hard hairdressers 
do just as good as cut as anybody. But um, yeah, I would say it's it's a little bit more, maybe a little bit more upmarket, a little bit more expensive. Um, you've got people like I know in America, so someone like John Frieda, for example, would have come down from the Leonard side. Um, salons like Michael John, the colorist salon, Daniel Galvin, um, other big names in London, Daniel Hersherson, they are all coming down through the, um, the, Leonard, the Leonard side. Whereas some people in America might know Trevor Sorby, for example, he would Everybody. be on, yeah, he would be on the, the uh, Sassoon, Sassoon side. side. Yep. Mm -hmm. So tell me how you got started. Tell me about the salons and sort of the prog progression of all of the salons. We met when we were about 24, 25. And cutting kind of a very long story short, we, we took over a bankrupt salon called Neville Daniel, which was just behind Harrods. And I'm sure all your viewers and at home will, will know that that's one landmark that most people yeah. know. So our salon that we took over was, was uh, just behind Harrods. It was losing £4,000 a week in 1992. And Helen and I, um, I was working there. It had gone bust. Helen came in to run it, cutting a long story short, really for, um, through the receivers. And basically, it went bust again, and we bought it. We bought it when it had got, well, it had virtually gone bust twice, hadn't it? Yeah. And it was losing four thousand pounds a week, and that's really when we started. We bought it for fifty thousand pounds mm. in 1992. Now that doesn't sound an awful lot of money to pay for a, for a salon these but days. You had all the losses you had to deal with. Absolutely, absolutely, we had all the losses to deal with, and at the end of the day, it, fifty thousand pounds was everything and more than what we had. So it we was were only it, 20 it was, it was five, 25, 26. Yeah. And, we, and, and we slowly turned that business around and within a year we were breaking even again. Um, we used to clean the salon. We used to we cut all the overheads down, kicked out half the staff, and we used to go in at six o'clock every morning. And one of the overheads that we, we could certainly do with that was the 800 pound a month cleaning bill. Yeah. Um, and we used to clean that salon from top to bottom. We Here's always sort of thought that we, when, when we met, I mean, I'd come from a very corporate background, so I was very much percentages, my payroll percentages, my stock costs, you know. And here was this creative mayhem going on, you know. And I always thought, I think we sort of knew right from the bat that if we put my brain together with his hands, we could make something pretty fantastic, mm. which is what we tried to do. Um, but, you know, it, it took a long time to, to sort of because these things have to take time to gel. We had to, uh, when we say we, 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 we sort of cull half the workforce, that's because half of them, you know, weren't, weren't doing, they, a lot of them were self-employed, and they were just doing a few clients a week each. So we had to make a very tight team mm -hmm. and get, make sure the tight team was all booked up and then they earned mm. more money. And then we built very, very slowly like that. So we had a very, very tight I core think, team. I think in those days, a lot of salons were run with, you know, it was, it, they, a lot of uh, salon owners, um, sort of the back end of the 80s, thought it was okay to have a staff room full of staff doing two clients a day. So it's better to have a staff room full of 20 people doing two clients a day rather than having a staff room full of no people busy all day. Do you see what I mean? Why? And Why would they put I think because they just thought they'd rather have, they'd rather a have, te yeah, uh, yeah um, a, a big group. Um, because so, because what happened with that kind of culture? I think that they were constantly poaching hairdressers. So you know, for example, they'd say to a hairdresser, "Oh, can you? Would you like to come and work for me? I'll give you seventy percent of your commission." Um, and they'd only turn up with about twenty clients. So they'd rather have those twenty clients and make thirty percent out of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Which is, you know, totally not the school that I'd come from, which was, you know, everybody had to be really, really maxed out. And then they earned very well. And then if they earned well, they stayed with you. And a busy, so a busy salon is a happy salon. Absolutely. Yeah. An empty staff room is a, is happy, a happy salon. salon. <laughs> Definitely. Absolutely right. Yeah. And, um, and, I'm, and I, think, I think also, um, to be fair, in the... A lot of these businesses, this business that, that went bust that we were working for was a hugely successful salon in the 80s. And I think it was, a, a, a lot of businesses really boomed in the 80s. Mm. But I think that a lot of the salon owners and owners of other businesses, didn't matter what businesses it, what you, you were in, people didn't know how to manage that money. And they thought, well, spend it, spend it, spend it. We'll live the high life and it will be there forever. But of like course the it's film not. Wall Street, isn't it? It's that yeah. greed yeah. is good. You know, yeah. it's that sort of time as well. Yeah, so it was, it was very much... So, and, and Extravagance. I think, I think particularly for hairdressers, you know, it, there was a time when just having a busy clientele and being a wonderful hairdresser was enough. 
to open a salon. We all know now, and certainly in this country, and Helen travels hundreds and hundreds of miles all, on, all around the country teaching hairdressers how to run their businesses because we all realise that just doing good haircuts ain't enough to keep your business mm. open. It's just not. I talk a lot about trying to explain to salons what their brand really means. And I said, Starbucks, you know, it costs 25 cents to brew a cup of coffee, but it costs four dollars. Your brand is the other 375. Absolutely. It's the experience that's really created. But it's interesting it. though, because quite a lot has changed, I think. I don't think really um, we set out to create a brand. I think our brand has actually just grown as we've grown over time. And I think now, if we were going to start up, you would put together a brand plan. Right. You, you would say, this is what our brand's going to be, yeah. this is what our logo's going to be, this is what our signage is going to look like, this is who our client, you know, our client base is. is. You know, we didn't have any clue about that. We just, our brand, you know, I think it was only about a year ago that we actually sat there and said to each other, hey, we've got a brand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't think of our, we didn't think of ourselves in that way, which they say it takes 10 years to build a brand. And I, I believe that's true. If it, It's going to come from the heart. I know that originally uh, the salon that you bought wasn't your name. So I know that at some point you were sharing a story with us earlier about how you felt when you did put your name on the salon. Can you share that story? Because I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, we traded and pulled that business, that bankrupt business around, but we were still trading under the Neville Daniel name. And we did that for five years. And it was just, um, so, sometimes things, your hands are forced in life. And, and, and our lease was expiring. And cutting a very long story short, we, we, we had to move. So we found a new salon on Sloan Street, but was actually 2,000 square feet less than what we were leaving. But for wow. the first time, it really felt like our business. So we'd been sort of hiding behind that Neville Daniel name. Nobody knew who we were. We weren't famous. We, I hadn't even done a single celebrity by then. And that's, we're talking sort of 14, 15 years yep. ago. Um, and we, I was introduced to a new, we didn't even have a PR, but we'd, we'd, we'd quietly built up this business. And it was doing quite well, uh, uh, e even with no PR and still under that old name. And this, 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 I was introduced to a new PR because a client of mine said, you've got to have a PR. For God's sake, you're only 30 years old now. You know, I mean, you're moving to this new salon. You, you, you know, you really got to, you got to push on and forge, for, forge forward. Um, anyway, I met this, this woman and we, and, and we took her on. And I, I do believe that sometimes in life that you, you, you do get a little bit of luck that sort of, you know, that, that comes from somewhere. And the luck that we had was she was a very dynamic PR who was very much at the early stages of her career, but she had a lot of contacts, so she was very much on the up. She said to me is that you have to change your name. You're 30 years old, you're both a dynamic couple, you've got this really good business going, but nobody knows who the hell you are. You've got to stick your name above the door, and I can really seriously PR you. And when she told me that, I just thought, oh, I, I hadn't even thought for a minute that I would want to have my name above the door. It wasn't something I really strove for. I think it was a very, it was a very difficult time because also, you know, when your name's above the door, you've got to step up to the plate, right? There's nowhere to hide. And I think for you, that felt Yeah, I was quite, quite happy daunting, just, yeah, wasn't quite it? quite happy sort of snipping away doing my clients. I thought, well, suddenly, you know, she's going to be asked, pushing me out to do stuff, to start doing photographic shoots, you know, how, what was I going to be like if I in interviews? What was I could, could I even do TV work? Could I do if I was lucky enough to get those opportunities? How would I be? If suddenly, I had a celebrity sitting in my chair. Am I going to go to pieces? Am I going to be all <laughs> starstruck? You know, <laughs> this was all a whole new environment for me. I think you know, in hindsight, what what where we were lucky is that we we started in a very strange way because we took over this bankrupt business. We didn't, it was someone else's name, so we could sort of hide behind it a little bit. And we built up a really quite a good business in that five years without having to worry about having my name above the door. And when we suddenly had a little bit of money to throw around and invest in PRs, and maybe I was start, I was 30 then, I was a little bit more confident, and we, you know, the, 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 the wolves, the, you know, the financial wolves were sort of, you know, not barking at the, at the salon door, you know. Um, <laughs> I think, I think actually it was the perfect time to change the name. You know, we didn't have, there wasn't the pressure. What did we really have to lose? 